Hey everyone, I hope you're doing great and following the three H's of the channel. And in this video, it's a group of campers from the southern United States that have a very terrifying run-in with something. So, if that sounds like something you're interested in, pull up a stump with me and let's jump into it. Thank you for watching. So recently, I've been reading some of the encounters that are posted on the internet, and while I really enjoyed them, there was a particular one that I read that kind of set something off in me. As I was reading it, I was brought back to some really disturbing memories that I had a long time ago, but it was remarkably similar. And I don't mean this in the way of a repressed memory, it was never repressed, it was just a very disturbing thing that happened to myself and some friends on a camping trip. We told people back then, quite a few people, but it's a pretty odd and pretty old story now that I make myself remember it all. And of course, nobody believed us. It was your typical, only the people that were there really know what happened. And I've long since fallen out of touch with the people involved. So of course, over the last 20 some years, it had sort of fallen in the back of my brain, as a lot of those things do. So I've spent some time trying to recall everything I can. I'm going on 40 now, and this was back in my college days. So, here's my story, and I'm going to give as many details as I can remember. It was summer, 2001. I can't remember exactly if it was June or July but it was one of the two. I wasn't taking any summer classes that year, and neither was my best friend John. Now John had been my buddy since middle school. We went to a southern college that's known for football and partying. There's a few of those, and that's unfortunately as specific as I'm going to get. John and I decided that it'd be fun to go camping. The weather that weekend was going to be relatively cool for summer. So I prodded my not very outdoorsy girlfriend, Lauren, into coming along. John and his girlfriend, Lisa, were on board too. Now, Lauren and I had been going out for almost two years by this point, so we were pretty close. John had only been dating Lisa for a month at most, and Lauren and I didn't know her very well. It seemed like they were getting serious already, so we figured that this would be a good chance to more closely get acquainted. Anyway, John's family is pretty country. They all fish and hunt and camp all the time. They also owned a boat, just a little fiberglass skiff with a center console. We decided that it'd be pretty cool to take the boat out offshore a bit, into salt water mind you, because there were a lot of small islands nearby that we could have to ourselves for the whole weekend. The island that we decided on was known or is known by two names. The first is what you'll generally see on charts or maps of the area, and that's Osprey Island. There's probably a hundred Osprey Islands out there, so I'm not too worried about anybody figuring out which one I'm talking about. That being said, some of the locals called it Crab Key, and no, not related to the 007 movie. Once, it was part of a small archipelago, but a lot of the other islands were washed away back in the 80s. So Crab Key was a cool little island, sand, obviously, with lots of pine trees and low scrub. It wasn't very big, but it was big enough from one end. You certainly couldn't see the woods to the other side. It was probably two miles long at the most, and only a few hundred feet wide. We loaded up the boat with our tents, sleeping bags, and a couple of coolers. My older brother had bought us some beer, which was pretty exciting at the time, and other necessities, and we set out on a Friday afternoon. Crab Key isn't far offshore, so we got there with plenty of daylight left. We just ran the skiff up on the sand. It was high tide, and since the boat was pretty light, we could push it out into the surf easily. John tossed the anchor out on the beach anyway, just to be safe. John and I had been to the island a few times before, 
always during the day. We would usually just explore around the shore a bit and fish, so we knew to pull the boat up near this trail that led to the palmettos. We grabbed the gear and started hiking on in. Like I said, the island isn't very thick, so it was only about a third of a mile or so. From where we beached to the spot we were planning on setting up camp. Now in hindsight, I really regret the spot that we decided to post up, but at the time, we didn't think twice about it. You see, the island had been inhabited a long time ago by Native Americans. I can't tell you the name of the tribe, that's not what I studied in school, but there were actually quite a lot of Indian tribes throughout the southeastern U.S. in the past, and a lot of them lived on the coast. One of the common archaeological features they left behind are called oyster mounds. Basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. They ate a lot of oysters, and these oysters have shells. When the Indians lived in one place for a long time, they tended to make huge piles of the old oyster shells, so that's what people had found in the middle of Crab Key. The mound wasn't huge though, and as an uneducated person, I'd suspect that the tribe had lived on the island probably didn't live there full time. Like I said, it wasn't far offshore, so it might have been a seasonal settlement. Anyway, the man was about seven feet high and big enough that the four of us, holding hands, only got maybe a quarter of the way around the perimeter. It was the center of a clearing, and it seemed like a cool place to camp. So that's where we set up. Now, like I said, I don't know much about the Indians that made the mound. According to the older kids I knew, like our elder siblings, back in the old days, quotes, when they were young, you could still sometimes find neat little artifacts out on Crab Key, usually like arrowheads or pottery shards. But apparently so many generations of teens had gone out to the island to drink or screw that all the cool stuff had been found. I know we never saw any relics other than the shells. We basically set up camp right next to the mound. John and I each had our own little dome tent, so it was essentially just two tents around a fire pit that we dug, and the coolers, pretty bare bones. It was the early summer dusk, maybe eight o'clock, when we finished our preparations. We had a big pile of fallen pine and a fire going. We had the tents up, and John and Lisa had already popped a couple of Bud Lights. We were just about to settle in for a night of underage drinking when Lauren realized that she had left her inhaler on the boat. Understand that Lauren had pretty bad asthma. It wasn't bad pollen season, at least, but she still didn't like to screw around, especially on an island, a good three hours away from any emergency room or nebulizer. So we had to make sure that her rescue inhaler was handy. Being the man, I told her I'd go get it, but she insisted that she wanted to tag along. I was fine with that, as I figured it would give us some alone time, so we set off down the trail to the shore. It took less than ten minutes to stroll from the campsite back to the shore. We grabbed her inhaler from the console in the boat, along with her cell phone. None of us had a signal, and... It was a very old cell phone, but whatever. I tried to put some moves down and get something going, but I didn't get any farther than second base before, suddenly, she said that she was feeling creeped out and wanted to head back to camp. I sighed and accepted. Like I said, she was not an outdoorsy kind of girl. It was edging toward dark, and it was utterly quiet out there except for a few bug chirps and the lapping of the waves. We get halfway back, right at the point where we can't see the shore or camp. It's pretty dim under the trees. Lauren was wearing a t-shirt over a bikini, so to be honest, I was just watching her butt the entire time walking back. All of a sudden she stops and turns around. Her face is all scrunched up, and just as she opens her mouth to talk, the smell hits me too. Now I've read all the Goatman stuff and all the stories like that, and it's always described as a weird coppery smell. 
this wasn't anything close to that. A lot of times it's hard to describe a weird smell, but this one was pretty clear out. Distinct body odor. It was as if that fat kid that we all knew in school, who never showered or understood what deodorant was, had found a dead raccoon on the side of the road and rolled around in it. Lauren is moaning. What the hell is that? I'm trying to take shallow breaths and not look like a pussy for gagging in front of her. I look around and say, it must be something dead in the bushes. She says, God, I'm going to barf. Why didn't we smell this when we came by the last couple times? I shrugged and pulled my shirt collar up over my nose. She did the same. I said, do you want to go look for it then? It might be a deer or something. They swim out to the island sometimes. Lauren shook her head violently. She says, screw that, let's just get back to the camp. She started jogging toward the camp, and I began to follow. Suddenly, there was a violent rustling in the palmetto and scrub, not far from the trail. We both froze, staring toward the shaking plants. Whatever it was, it was quick and retreating, and the sound faded into the brush. What the hell was that? Lauren said. I said, probably something eating whatever it is we're smelling, an opossum or something. We stood there for a few seconds, trying to beat back the heebie-jeebies, and then without saying anything else, we resumed our jog back to camp. After a few minutes, we rounded a bend on the trail and entered the clearing. John, who was standing by the campfire with his arms akimbo, whirled as we came upon him. We were both panting from the trot that we maintained all the way back. Where the hell were you guys, he said. We were taken aback by how agitated he seemed. What's your problem, Lauren said. John looked at both of us for a second, probably wondering why we were both sweaty and assuming we had been screwing, but we weren't. And then he turned back in the direction that he had been facing a moment ago. I don't know where Lisa went. She said that she needed to pee right after you guys left. He was taking half steps in a circle, looking out into the now dark woods. It's been half an hour by now. Didn't you guys hear me hollering? I hadn't even thought of it until just now writing this, but we hadn't. We hadn't heard anybody shouting anything at the time, and the island is small enough that you could hear somebody really shouting from anywhere. So that's something weird that I hadn't realized at the time. Anyway, I asked John why he hadn't gone looking for her, and he just shrugged. By now, I had gotten over the creeps of the event back on the trail, so I suggested that Lauren stay in camp, and I'd go with John to find Lisa. It was only a little spit of sand, and we could Amish search it, the whole place by midnight if we had to. Luckily, we didn't have to. We barely left camp in the direction that Lisa had left in when we spotted her, her white t-shirt easily visible even in the twilight. She was standing in a thicket of palmetto, which was pretty dumb, considering how much a diamondback rattler might appreciate such a hiding place. She was facing away from us, toward the opposite shore. John called out to her, but she didn't respond. I called out to her. Nothing. We walked toward her, calling at her with rising apprehension, until we were on the edge of the thick shrubs. She was just standing there, back to us, staring into the dark. John and I exchanged looks, thoroughly freaked out, and then we waded into the palmetto. He said her name once more, softly, before slowly reaching his arm toward her. The moment his hand touched her shoulder, she jolted and spun around, breathing hard. John jumped backwards. John? She seemed to be genuinely surprised. What the hell, you scared the crap out of me. John said, what? We've been calling your name for 30 minutes, and you're standing out here in the dark like a freak. And we scared you? 
She creased her eyebrows, confused, and shook her head. I did not. I just came out here to pee. She looked down. It was only barely noticeable in the dark, but there was an obvious wet stain in her khaki shorts. She stuttered, I, I, clapping her hands over her mouth. She'd peed herself. We all stood there stunned for a few seconds, and then John snapped a sense and walked back to her, taking her into a hug. Hey, I don't know what happened, but it's not a big deal, okay? Lisa was speechless. So was I. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. I was thinking to myself about seizures or something. Meanwhile, Lisa starts crying softly into John's shoulder, and he turns to look at me with his go back to camp while I take care of this look. So I did just that. I only had a minute or two to explain to Lauren what happened before they reappeared at the edge of the light from the campfire. Lisa was looking at her feet, her face still deeply red, but John, without a word, went into their tent and came back out a moment later with some fresh clothes for her. She went to the other side of the oyster mound, and when she came back, she was wearing some jean shorts and a yellow tank top. I guess she'd thrown everything else she was wearing out into the woods because she wasn't carrying any of her old clothes. The three of us had taken seats around the campfire, still silent and similarly silent. She joined us. It took some time, but after we'd had a few beers, things lightened back up again. The mood turned fun. We all got a buzz on. And the rest of the night was what we were hoping for. Jokes, making out, and a lot of bullshitting. We turned in sometime in the early morning. I got laid and all was at peace with the world. I was awoken though, most unpleasantly, by John shouting my name. I jerked upright from the deep, black sleep of the drunken hangover, gasping for breath, the way a drowning man does when pulled above water. John had unzipped our tent and was yelling at me from the circular entry. Lauren was pressed right against me in the sleeping bag, nude, and moaning for John to shut up. I couldn't even get a word out through my dry mouth, so I waved him off while nodding, trying to signal that I was getting up. John backed off, finally quiet, leaving me to extricate myself from the arms of my naked girlfriend and the nice comfy sleeping bag. I put on some shorts and a shirt, and groggily climbed out of the tent in the humid morning air. John was frantically pacing around the blackened remains of our campfire. He whirled toward me as soon as I was out of the tent. Dude, Lisa's gone again. Nothing was registering with me yet. I yawned and stretched. What? Lisa is gone. When I woke up, she wasn't there. I had been shouting. How the hell did you not wake up? I shrugged still not fully invested in the conversation. I don't know. What? It was starting to crystallize in my head that Lisa was gone. I said something half intelligent like, what's her problem? John had already turned around and started into the brush. Come on, we've got to find her. I hesitated for a second and then turned to poke my head back into the tent. I doubt Lauren even heard me. But I told her I was going to help John find Lisa. She murmured something in her sleep. It took me a minute to catch up with John, who was moving at a pretty frantic pace through the underbrush, calling for Lisa all the while. I didn't bother trying to talk when I caught up, just following along, looking around us. The island was pretty wide open, nothing but straight-trunked pine trees and low scrub so you can see a pretty long way. It wasn't some twisted, gnarled old-growth forest, and it isn't claustrophobic at all. Lisa, John was shouting. It seemed pretty silly when I think about it. Like I said, the island was so small that a person standing at one end could likely hear a loud cry from the other without a problem. How did this girl keep getting lost? John was shouting, and I was worried that she'd have another seizure or episode, and that she could be seriously hurt 
out in the bush somewheres. This went on for about an hour. We'd reach one shore, follow it to the tip of the island, and then cut back into the woods and follow an overgrown trail all the way back to the far tip. It was on that far end of the island that we made our first unpleasant discovery, at the fringe of the underbrush, right where the bush meets the sand of the beach. We found a huge swath of flattened foliage, as if something big had rolled around here to make a bed, but all of the green brush was covered in a fan spray of tacky, reddish-brown blood. There was no doubt about what it was. John and I had both hunted, him a lot more than I, but we both got a deer, hog, but there was no doubt that something big had been completely mutilated here. But there was nothing but the tacky spray of blood, no fur, no bones, no half-eaten carcass. We were completely mute. We both were thinking the same thing, but neither could think of anything to say. I'm sure his brain was running the same routine as mine. Rationalize it. It was a deer. There's a bobcat, or maybe a panther out here. Sure, there's an adult panther on this tiny island who eats deer and doesn't leave a scrap of bone. Okay. Okay. The air smelled awful. It was already hot. Much hotter than the weather report had predicted. And the smell was exactly like what you'd expect from one of those goat man stories. But there was no mystical reason for it. No question. The coppery twang of blood. John gulped down a gag from next to me. So, we left. There was no reason to stay. We hiked through the woods, past the gore-covered matted clearing, back toward the camp. John grew more and more frantic, and I grew more and more annoyed. I'm not going to say I wasn't worried. I was. I was really worried about Lisa, but I barely knew her. And in the past 12 hours, she had mysteriously disappeared twice and was screwing up what was supposed to be a fun weekend. And to top it off, she was royally freaking me the hell out. So we get back to camp, and guess what we see? I'm sure you already know. Lisa and Lauren are sitting next to the campfire, which is burning again, cooking up some bacon from the cooler. I sigh and mutter something profane under my breath, but John loses it. He runs into the clearing, gibbering like a madman, yelling at Lisa, where have you been? We've been shouting for you all morning. What the hell is your problem? Lisa and Lauren look utterly stunned. Lisa just stares at him silently, eyes wide. But Lauren takes it for a couple of seconds, and then jumps up and starts giving it right back. Why don't you settle down and quit being an asshole? We haven't heard you shouting anything. Why don't you just relax? About halfway through her counter-assault, she starts glaring at me, like I had something to do with this. So I walk up and put a hand on John's shoulder and give him the kind of quick, just calm down lecture that only a close friend can give. Afterwards, he shuts up and sits down next to Lisa. Sorry, I was just really worried. Lisa nods. So we all sit around the fire for a bit. We eat some bacon except for Lisa, who takes her share and just stares at it. Some more awkward silence, and then Lauren grabs my shoulder and gives me a let's go somewhere private look. We make our excuses to John and Lisa and head into the woods on the far side of the oyster mound. We get a few hundred yards down the trail when Lauren spins around to face me. What the hell is up with them, she says. I'm unprepared and just throw up my hands in a what? Me worry? Jester. First, she disappears last night. Then you guys disappear this morning, and she hasn't said a word since I got her out of the tent. I'm just shaking my head, having no idea what's going on. I said, hang on. John woke me up because Lisa was missing this morning, and we've just spent the last couple of hours tromping around trying to find her, and then we find you guys making breakfast 
like nothing ever happened. What do you mean she was in the tent? Now it was Lauren's turn to look confused for a second. I got up after you left, and she was in the tent. I woke her up, got the fire going, and we've been sitting there, awkward as hell because she won't say anything, waiting for the two of you to. And we looked at each other for a long moment. This is really screwed up, I said. After another long silence, she nodded, digesting her own thoughts. I want to go home, Lauren said. Part of me wanted to disagree, wanted to be a man and chalk it all up to the silliness and get our weekend back on track. But all I did was nod. Okay, I said. We headed back to camp. John and Lisa are still sitting right where we left them, still silent. For some reason, I feel like I need to explain to John what Lauren and I have been discussing. So I asked John if he can come down to the boat with me to get some stuff we left there, while giving Lauren an I-know-what-I'm-doing look. John agrees and we head off. Ten minutes later, we're standing by the boat, which is resting completely on the damp, low-tide shore, a good ten feet from the shallow, lapping water. So John... Lauren and I think that we should leave as soon as we can. Huh? John responds. How come? How come? Seriously. How come your girlfriend keeps disappearing? John starts shaking his head. F you, man. That's not cool. I said, look, I don't know what happened last night, but I'm thinking that she's a secret epileptic or something. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. We stared at each other for a few seconds. Lauren says she was in your tent after we left. What? Are you sure she was? You know, gone. I asked, trying to make sense of the situation. Are you kidding? I think I can tell if there's a second person in my effing tent, dude. Okay. Okay, I say, raising my hands up in a settle-down gesture. Lauren just said that after we left, she got up and Lisa was sleeping in your tent. I don't know what's going on, but I agree with Lauren that we should just call this a weekend and head back. John was shaking his head, trying to figure out what he wanted to say. When I saw his eyes focus on something behind me and widen, I turned and immediately saw what had caught his attention. The plastic housing had been yanked off of the outboard motor on the boat. It was laying on the boat. The clips that held it in place had been snapped off. The motor had been brutalized, vandalized, really. The spark plug wires were yanked out, ripped, and torn apart from the plug heads. Much of the other wiring was ripped to pieces. The prop was completely gone, as well as the pin. It took a few seconds to sink in just how screwed we suddenly were. At the same time, we both said, what the F? Before either of us had a chance to fully internalize what we were seeing, a piercing scream echoed out of the woods behind us, coming from the camp. Without a thought, we took off down the trail in a dead sprint. We found Lauren sitting in the middle of the trail, a hundred feet or so from the bend that entered the clearing. She was on her knees, knuckles in her mouth, hyperventilating. She looked at us as we ran up to her, eyes confused and panicked. I fell to my own knees next to her, putting my hands on her shoulders. I shook her and called her name. She blinked a few times, her eyes seeming to focus. I said, what is it? What is it? She just shook her head and pointed. John and I turned to look, and a pile at the base of a palmetto plant was just on the edge of the trail were a pair of jean shorts and a yellow tank top, and they were stained dark red. Oh, what the F, John said, moving toward them for a closer look. Lauren stammered. I was coming out to... I had to poop, she said to my ear. I was coming back to camp, and she just started crying. Her hands balled into fists, and she was hitting me in the chest. She said... What are you guys doing? What's going on? Dude, John said from behind me, these are Lisa's. 
We stared at each other. None of us could think of anything better to do. Lauren said, I want to go home. I promised her we were, soon, but we had to pack up. She looked very unhappy, but nodded. I helped her back to her feet, and we tromped through the pine needles back to camp. I didn't have the heart to tell her about the boat. We get back to camp, and there's Lisa, sitting calm as can be by the dead campfire. John runs over to her, almost as if he is surprised to see her still in one piece, and takes her into his arms and starts whispering into her ear. Lauren and I can see from his face that he's going to pieces, but he seems to be doing his best, in a crazy way at least, to comfort and get through to Lisa. We are both just glad that she is, in fact, in one piece. We stand awkwardly at the edge of camp for a bit, watching John whisper reassurances to Lisa. Eventually, I decide that I need to fill Lauren in on the boat situation, so I lead her a bit away, and I tell her what we'd seen. I was expecting a Lisa-level freakout, but she took it more calmly than John or I probably had. She said very matter-of-factly, it must have been an animal. Raccoons tear stuff up all the time. There was no questioning in her voice. I nodded. You're probably right. It only took a second to convince myself it was probably a friggin' raccoon. Keep in mind that I had, in fact, experienced raccoon mayhem many times in my life, and they can actually cause some pretty serious damage if they want to get in or out of something, and it wasn't hard to make me believe it. I debated with myself whether to tell Lauren about the bloodstained clearing, but decided that she was taking things way too well, and that there was no reason to screw that up. So we spent a few minutes discussing strategies for getting home. She asked if John and I could fix the boat. I said probably not. She asked if we could swim to shore. I said probably, if we were desperate. She checked her phone for signal. It, of course, didn't have any. None of us did. We were still brainstorming options. None of them were all that well thought out when John found us. Guys, he said, I'm worried about Lisa. That got our attention. She won't say anything, he said. He was looking at the ground, brow knitted. I don't know what to do. Lauren nodded. She wouldn't talk to me this morning. I'm worried too. Maybe she really did have some kind of seizure or something. Has she ever said anything to you about, like, medical stuff or anything like that? Lauren sounded almost hopeful. Hopeful for an answer that made sense. No, said John, shaking his head. I mean nothing like this. I don't know what to do. We spent some time in a little circle discussing our escape plans, but nothing really great came to mind. To reiterate... The island wasn't terribly far from shore. John and I were strong swimmers, so if we got really desperate, we could make it for help. Still, the water was very shallow in places, and full of sharp-as-hell oyster bars, and potentially swarming with bull sharks. So, that was a resort that we weren't freaked out enough to really use yet. We end up going back to camp. It's probably 11 o'clock, maybe closer to noon. It's hot as hell. There's tons of biting flies, and no seams, and there's no spirit of fun. Nobody wants to go swimming to cool off. Nobody wants to tell jokes. It's just the three of us trying to make stiff conversation, while little Miss Sunshine is sitting there, dead silent. Occasionally, Lisa would look up at one of us, suddenly, and stare. Mostly, she'd just keep her eyes locked dead on the fire. At one point, John left to go work on the boat. I was going to go too, but Lauren made it clear that she didn't want to be alone. There was no reason to point out that she wasn't alone. She was with Lisa, but it didn't need to be said. John was gone for an hour or two, and he came back looking dejected, I knew that was coming. The motor was trashed. So the afternoon passes by. 
the three of us basically stunned into inaction. I mean, looking back, I'm thinking the same thing anybody else is reading this. Why aren't you guys building a raft, making shelter, tying up Lisa, so she doesn't disappear again? I know, I know, but we were young, and again, nothing really outright crazy was going on. We were somewhere in the doldrums between calm and panic. Twilight starts to come on, and we've spent the entire day doing basically nothing. At one point, Lauren and I went and gathered more firewood, so we were set for the night. Around six o'clock, John led Lisa by the hands to the tent and laid her down. I remember looking at her through the round door, just before John zipped it up. She was laying on her back, like a corpse, eyes wide open, staring at the roof of the tent. With Lisa in the tent, we started conversing somewhat normally again. We got the fire going, and as twilight was coming on, popped a few more beers, and at least for a little while, forgot about the obvious problems and started having some fun. I mean, again, the boat was weird, but it probably was just a raccoon. We were easily within reach of land if it came to that, and it probably wouldn't, because there was usually a lot of local traffic around the bay, checking crab traps or fishing, or even just coming to the island to hang out. As for the blood, I convinced myself that it was just from some predation event, and Lisa, although acting weird as shit, was probably asleep in the tent and not actively bringing us down. The good mood lasted well until full past dark. I don't know what time exactly, but it had been dark a while. John gets up to pee. He had only been gone a few paces before he stopped. Guys, I remember he muttered. Lauren and I turned around, both mid laugh. The smiles drained from our faces like something you'd see in a movie. The door to John's tent was unzipped, wide open. The tent was empty. You've got to be effing kidding me, Lauren hissed. We were both up instantly. John was in his tent, rifling for a flashlight. A moment later, I was in my backpack, grabbing the battery lanterns I brought. I handed one to Lauren, who looked at it with hesitation. She obviously knew what it meant, and didn't like it. We've got to find her, I said. Lauren just stared at me, wide-eyed, and shook her head. How the hell did she unzip the tent and leave without any of us noticing, or hearing her, John said. His voice was tinged with panic, kind of high-pitched. He was shining his mag light in random directions, the white light cutting through the dark pine woods. Let's split up, he said. I said, uh, screw that. That was my instant reply. I don't know if you've ever seen a horror movie before, John, but there's no way that I'm leaving Lauren alone, or you alone, and there's no way I'm going out there alone, right now. My speech was definitely not that sensible, but it was probably something similar. Lauren agreed, so John formed up with us, and as a small triangle of bodies and flashlights, we set out down the weedy trail that started nearest to the tent. To reuse the phrase, we went about this Amish search for a while, arms pretty much linked, eyes facing every direction. We'd grown up on Scooby-Doo, and we weren't letting anybody fall through a trap door, or any kind of reversible bookshelf, or anything. When we first left camp, we were shouting Lisa's name, but after ten minutes, we gave up. She absolutely would have heard us, but she absolutely wasn't answering. So we searched in silence, gritting ourselves against a seemingly inevitable horror movie moment where the cat leaps out of the closet while the guy with the hatchet is under the bed. Anyway, we work our way around pretty much the entire island. If it was hypothetically midnight when we started looking, it was probably three or four in the morning now. I could tell from the sky that dawn was a while off. Suddenly, we realize we've come around to the boat. Lauren breaks from the group for a bit and goes over to the boat. John and I, who are still peering into the woods, hear her gasp. We both whirl around, 
I mean, our nerves are raw, and Lauren's gasp is probably the first human sound we've heard in two hours. She raises an arm to shield her eyes from the flashlight beams we've leveled on her, then gestures toward the boat. No way, John groaned. The fiberglass had been all scratched to hell. Deep gouges and shallow lines were etched into every surface of the boat. The cushions of the seats were shredded, fiber padding strewn from literally bow to stern. We ran the lights over the exterior of the hull, looking at the frantic, deep gouges in the material. It seemed in hindsight that there were almost patterns in there, but there weren't. I wish I could say something really spooky, like they were cave drawings of mastodons or 666 or skulls and crossbones or something, but it wasn't. It was just like a three-year-old scribbling in a coloring book. And then we also noticed the broken oyster shells spread around the boat. It was somewhere between low and high tide, so water was lapping at the stern of the boat, but the bow was high and dry, and in the damp sand were dozens of broken shells, many with curls of plastic and fiberglass stuck to the sharp tips. I remember Lauren stifled a moan and then started crying. I put my arm around her and pulled her close. I just want to go home, she cried. I remember her face turning red, her eyes pink, tears pooling and running down her cheeks. John wasn't doing any better. He had returned his flashlight beam to the woods and he was whipping it around without any purpose. Panic was obviously setting in. It was nipping at me too, but I guess I was just in a slightly better headspace than my friends. And then John screamed, and Lauren screamed. John's flashlight beam had stopped, and it was illuminating Lisa. She was on the edge of the trees, her face pale, her hair messy and tangled, pine straw and twigs all through it. As in response to John and Lauren's screams, Lisa began screaming as well. I don't know how the hell I managed to hold it together, but I recall thinking something kind of silly, like, at least she's talking again. So I started shaking Lauren by her shoulders. She dropped her lantern to the ground. John had gotten himself under control, as had Lisa apparently, because silence descended over the beach. The only sound, as usual, was the lapping of wavelets against the shore. At this point, I'd like to make another hindsight observation. I can't believe we didn't think about it then, but I also realized my mind wasn't exactly functioning in a logical way. Maybe John or Lauren noticed it, but they never mentioned it to me. Lisa was at this point wearing the same khaki shorts and white t-shirt that she had been wearing when we first arrived. The shorts that she'd peed herself in. The outfit that she changed out of the very first night. And only now, looking back, do I realize that she had been wearing that when John and I first came back from the boat. The bloody clothes that we found on the trail. Those were the clothes that she changed into that first night in the woods. It's maybe a little bit contrived, but... Some of this only is just now seeming so obvious to me, but now Lisa starts gasping and crying, and then she starts sobbing John's name. John runs over to her and wraps his arm around her. She does the same. They're wrapped in each other's embrace. Lisa starts panting. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Over and over again. Lauren and I turn to face each other. Both are speechless, when from the woods nearly rips this utterly terrifying howl. Again, John and I are both pretty woodsy, John more than I, but we're both campers, we're both hikers, he hunts with his family a lot, we were both stricken by this sound, the sound from before I could describe, but this sound I really can't. If you've ever heard raccoons mating, they make this wild, high-pitched, ululating sort of screech. 
That's the base. Put it on top of a helping of those fake Bigfoot groans you see from those awful Animal Planet specials. And maybe like the sound of the T-Rex from Jurassic Park. And you can kind of imagine the type of sound that I'm talking about. Not entirely accurate, but it's the best I can do. The four of us freeze. John and I, the only two still holding flashlights, spin to face the sound. But there's nothing there. I hear Lauren mutter, Oh God, from beside me. I reach out and arm sideways, the same way a dad does to hold his kid back when he slams the brakes on in the car. The howl comes again, this time, closer. John, who's holding Lisa by the shoulder, starts to back up toward Lorne and I, who are nearer to the boat. I hear John muttering F-U-C-K under his breath. Finally, the howl bursts out once more, and this time, wades you close. There's a frantic commotion from the underbrush. Something is definitely coming toward us now, and fast. John twirls around Lisa by her shoulder and starts to run, trying to close the fifty-odd feet between us. As he does so, I do the same to Lauren, spinning her and running for the boat. Now, I have no idea why we all instinctively ran for the boat. It was still a third beached, and the motor was dead as dirt. But hey, we weren't really thinking in that moment. So I'm basically throwing Lauren into the boat when I hear the muffled scuff of something hitting beach sand and a curse from behind me. I turn and see that John and Lisa have fallen onto the beach. John's flashlight has tumbled away from him. At the same time, Lauren slips on the wet fiberglass of the boat and falls down into the bow, taking my flashlight with her. This is the point that I still find hard to believe or remember, but I'm going to type out the first things that come to mind and trust it to be accurate as possible. I'm looking at the vague, dark forms of John and Lisa laying on the ground, maybe 20 feet away from the boat. The moon is pretty dark, maybe a quarter moon. From the brush and scrub emerges this shape. It's human, but not right. It's hard to describe, except, well, Lauren and I saw a movie a year later that really helped. I remember when he appeared on screen for the first time, the character, I felt cold and a bit of nauseousness. Lauren simply stood up and left the theater. I followed shortly after. It was actually one of the last times that Lauren and I saw each other. It was Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, and of course, the character was Golem. The shape was, like I said, humanoid. It almost shimmered in the faint moonlight. It padded across the sound, four-legged, like an animal. But awkwardly, its body was obviously not designed for a quadruped locomotion. I watched with wide eyes as it beelined for John's fallen flashlight. It leapt upon it like a cat on a bird and began thrashing against the sand, grasping it and beating it into the shore again and again. This all happened in the blink of an eye, really. John, staring at this occurring only a few feet from where he lay, managed to pull himself together and dragged Lisa back up, half running, half crawling, toward the boat. I helped him toss Lisa in, and together we began shoving at the bow of the boat, trying to get it back into the deeper water. I didn't look back at whatever was happening on the shore just behind me, this thing was squealing now, like a pig in shit, as the saying goes. I could still hear the thumping of the light hitting the dense, wet sand. And there was this light itself, of course. The beam of light was slicing up and down toward us, illuminating the boat, and then up into the sky, and then back down. And then nothing. It went dark. And immediately, the thumping stopped. John and I had succeeded in getting the entire boat back into the water, but it was still very shallow. Our feet were wet, but the water wasn't even up to our ankles. The girls were now screaming from where they were laying on the boat, 
And then the thing screamed from behind us. It was terrifying before, from the woods. It was far worse when the thing was screeching down the backs of our shirts. I turned to look, and what I saw, well, I don't have any trouble remembering. I don't need any help to describe. It looked like a silverback gorilla, not so thick and muscular, but the same pose. It rested with its legs hunched low. Two stringy, muscular arms beat the sand around it in a rage. I couldn't see the face that clearly after all. It was dark. But I was struck by a sense of humanity. There were two eyes, there was a nose, and there was a mouth, perhaps a bit distorted, but not so noticeably as the body, at least not in the shadows of the sliver of a moon. Anyway, it howled again and seemed poised to charge at us. What I did next was purely a reflex. I reached down into the bow and yanked from beneath the prone body of my terrified girlfriend the lantern that she had pulled from my hands. At the time, I meant to throw that at the thing, but I missed, and I missed bad. The lantern whirred past its shoulder and landed with a puff on the sand at the edge of the beach, just short of the palmettos. The thing seemed surprised. It sniffed the air. Then it turned, and in an instant, it was after the light. John and I couldn't move for a few moments, but the urgency of the moment took over again. We were shoving the boat, using every ounce of ability. Finally, there was a squeak, and the boat was free of the sand. We pushed more, forcing it into hip-deep water. Then we both climbed in and turned and watched. We could still see the frantic movement of the lantern, just a beam of light, being pounded against the sand. Occasionally, we would hear a squeal or a groan from the thing on the beach. Finally, after thirty or forty seconds, the light flickered and went black. Then there was silence. The only sound was the lapping of water against the side of the boat. The current, luckily, was taking us away from the island. We drifted for a few hours before the sun started to come up. By then, we were close enough to the mainland to entertain the idea of swimming in. Lisa, though, was pretty much out of it. She was talking and crying, but nobody thought it was a good idea to put her into the water, so we waited. Eventually, we drifted near another boat, a charter fishing guide out with a client. We babbled some story to him. I'm sure he just assumed that we were some dumb, drunk kids who got lost and almost died of a heat stroke. Either way, he towed us in. And that's about the entire story. Like I said, we told plenty of people. It wasn't some great secret among us, but not one person believed it. Lisa and John broke up almost instantly. They didn't even really break up. John just never saw or spoke to her ever again. Laura and I lasted a little longer. We just stopped talking about the event one day, until that night at the movies. I drove her home. We talked a few times on Trillion, but we never saw each other again. And then, years go by, decades, and some stupid stories on the internet stir all of this back up. Even just sitting here, after I've typed all this out, I keep telling myself that this sounds crazy, like it's some just cracked out homeless bum, or island person, or a hermit. There was even times when I hoped that the whole thing was my older siblings playing some kind of prank, but it wasn't. This whole thing really did happen. None of us ever really spoke to Lisa again, as far as I know anyways. After Lauren and I split up, we similarly never had contact. She transferred to a school in California, and when her junior year came around, John is the sadder story. He pretty much dropped out right after all this happened. He never went back to school in the fall. We hung out every now and then, but slowly, he just stopped returning phone calls and emails. Eventually, he just fell off the radar. 
The last thing I heard from him was from his mom, probably a few years after all this happened. He just moved out and didn't leave any contact information. Since then, in the modern age of the internet, I guess, I look for him now and then on Facebook or LinkedIn, Twitter, things like that, but I've never seen any sign of him. I do worry about my friend, though. So, that was a lot, wasn't it? If you liked the video, be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment and all that stuff. Uh, if you have a story of your own, I have an email in the description below that you can send them to if you'd like to. Also down there is a PayPal and a Patreon if you would like to donate to the channel that way. And of course, super thanks here on YouTube. And as for me, my voice is pretty much shot right now. So, I hope you have a good week, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for pulling up a stump with me, and thank you for watching.